what is the the connection between attention and awareness and then self-awareness okay so we've talked a lot about how in the view that i take which i think is the only possible rational view when you really think about it and the view that i take uh we claim to have these kinds of conscious experience magic inside of us because there's some kind of model in the brain telling us that we have that. There's some kind of bundle of information. And that bundle of information is a description. It's the brain's description of something. But it's so simplified that when we talk about it, we describe it as kind of an inner magic. Well, what is the real thing that's being depicted in the particular theory that I have been, my lab has been outlining for the past 10 years. It's called the attention schema theory. The real thing is attention. So the real physical thing that could be described physically, but is very, very complicated is that the brain allocates resources and deeply processes a thing like the apple to go back to the apple example. The brain looks at that apple, takes in visual information about it and deeply processes and um, allocates a, a lot of resources to that apple, to figuring out what it is and where it is and what to do with it and what it means in context and so on. That's attention. The brain then builds a model of its own attentional relationship to the apple. And that model is a simplified depiction of attention. And in the model, what the model says is, ah, you have a kind of non-physical magical experience that has glommed onto the apple. Your, your mind has taken possession of the apple. You are now able to make choices with respect to the apple and, and know what it is and remember it and think about it. Um, that's what that model is telling us. And then higher cognition uh, gets hold of information from that model and says, aha, I am conscious of the apple. I have a conscious experience of it. And then we report that verbally. That's the theory. It's it's basically an identification that says, okay, the real thing, there is a real thing, a real physical thing that is being described by this model that then makes us say we have conscious experience. But the real thing is attention. Uh, that's That's the theory. And the theory is based partly because it makes a certain amount of rational sense. Um, but also there's oodles of data. There's a hundred years worth of data where people have looked at this and scratched their heads and said, isn't it weird that the things that our brains focus attention on almost always match the things that we say we have a conscious experience of? Mm-hmm. You know, those two things are almost always together. You have to work really hard in a lab to break them apart and make the brain make a mistake. But otherwise, they they go together. So that's that's the relationship. So talking about hard work in the lab, are there any crucial sort of experiments that you've run that help you develop this theory? Um. Well, the, the theory came about from looking at prior literature, mostly. Okay. But we have done a lot of studies since then. And, um, and what we find is that, uh, indeed, what, you, what your brain focuses attention on and what you claim to be have a conscious experience of almost always match. Where they don't match i.e., let's say you have really dim stimuli or you mask them a little bit with flashy lights and things like that. Uh, so maybe the at the edges of what the brain can process, uh, things break down and the brain can actually allocate attention to something, but you'll say, I didn't see it, I wasn't conscious of it. Like You can get those such situations. They've been known for a while. Um, it takes some work to construct them. But when you do that, what you're really doing is making the model fail, right? So you're paying attention to something, but the brain's not building a model that says, I'm paying attention to it. So it's like paying attention to it without knowing that you are, without knowing that you're 
conscious of it. And that's a very interesting situation to us. Um, and uh, we've done a lot of experiments looking at that particular situation and what's what functions are preserved and, and what functions break down. So um, that's one of the many lines of research that we think, uh, you know, supports this whole framework. Mm -hmm. There are also many illusions of our being conscious of things that we aren't. So you mentioned speaking a lot to Daniel Dennett. He has this example that I love so much where if you hold a, a playing card like at the periphery of your vision, you can't tell what color it is, what color the the suit is, even though you have the sense that you see color everywhere. You only see color in this very narrow window of your field of vision. And you realize that you have to, if you bring this playing card closer and closer to uh, your fovea, I, I don't know, I guess the fovea is a part of your eye. It's not, it's not this place out there. Um, it's, the, it's the central, central vision. Yes. If you, you have to bring it very close to your central, central area of vision to actually be able to tell that there is in fact color for color to actually enter your awareness. That's that's right. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So but, go ahead. Oh, go on. No, you you please. Okay, I was going to say. So crucially, there's a there's a component to this theory. So now we're going to get slightly more complicated, maybe. But there's a component to this theory that is really crucial. That's beyond just, am I conscious of a thing? Am I conscious of this? Am I conscious of that? Um, and that is how I see other people. And in humans, at least, uh, consciousness is used not just personally, but socially. And so I perceive consciousness in you. Uh, that's how we can have a nice conversation. And I perceive consciousness in, you know, dogs and cats even. Because, and it's also automatic. Yes, it's automatic. Uh, it's absolutely right. And so what we suspect is that the same mechanisms are at work. And they work in exactly the same way. I look at you, uh, your body language and your eyes and your speech and manner so on tells me that you're probably paying attention to something. Um, in this case, you're paying attention to me, but maybe you're paying attention to the sandwich or the donut or whatever it is. And I look at you and I figure that out. Well, attention is a really complicated thing. If you really look at actual um, neurophysiological attention, right? But I don't build an accurate model of your attention, right? I don't say to myself, aha, his neurons are processing the donut but there's a competition among signals in the neurons and the donut signal has arisen up and is now dominance in his frontal parietal networks, right? That's not what's going on in my brain. Instead, something much simpler, a much simpler model is being constructed, a quick and dirty, simple model that says, aha, he is conscious of the donut. Aha, he is not conscious of the sandwich over there, but he is conscious of the donut. Or, aha, he's not conscious of the puddle. He's going to walk into it. I better tell him about it, right? So these are very, very simple models that we construct of other people. We attribute conscious states to other people uh, as a proxy for their attentional state, right? So it's the same. It's the same mechanism, and um, and that too, we uh, one can collect data. We have a lot of data on how people attribute attention and consciousness to others. Mm -hmm. Right. And from reading the literature on folk psychology, I have the sense that one of the reasons we developed this ability in, in seeing others to, to attribute mental states to them is that it would be extremely difficult to live in social groups if we couldn't tell, oh, he wants to hurt me. Anyway, the the question, though, that this raises for me is, which came first? Did we develop models of attention for ourselves and then attribute them to others? Or did it go the other way around? Or did it happen in sync? I would say almost certainly we evolved self-models first. 
because I don't see how we could function in any way without self models. But then having adapted that same machinery to build models of others, I think probably there's an evolutionary um, resonance or a, a interaction where evolving better models of others helps to evolve better models of self. And likewise, so there's probably some co-evolution of both of those, but the very first models are probably self models. Right. I, I know that some animals, it's been a few years since I was reading about this, but they've done research on, I guess it wouldn't be, it would be called chimpanzee folk psychology rather than human folk psychology, but chimpanzees, and I know you've worked a lot on primates, have a, a primitive theory of mind about other people and primates. And I would wonder if this coincides with the same animals that might recognize themselves in a mirror or that have, I guess, higher degrees of self-awareness. So I don't, I don't know how you might study this. So um, theory of mind is really tricky. There are some tests of theory of mind that are really, in my view, overly stringent. Actually, I don't think my view is all that uh, rare. I think a lot of people look at these view these tests of theory of mind. So, you know, the classic one is the Sally Ann test, which goes like this. Sally puts her toy in a covered basket, basket A, but there's basket B next to it. Sally goes away. Anne, being devious, takes the toy out of basket A, puts it in basket B, and covers the two baskets. Sally comes back. Which basket will she look in first for her toy? Well, if you have theory of mind and you understand baskets and so on, then you say, oh, she'll look in basket A because that's where she put it. She thinks it's there. Uh, if you don't have theory of mind, you might say, oh, she'll look in basket B because that's where it is. Right. But if you understand that Aunt, that Sally has a mind and that her mind contains a false belief, then you can figure out this and that. Right. So that's the stringent test. And it turns out that children before the age of, I don't know, about six or five or something can't solve the task. Um, and most animals can't. Chimpanzees can to some degree. I think crows uh, can to some degree. Uh, but it's a really complicated. It's like it's like a shell game. It was like baskets and this and that and toys and blah, blah, blah. And one time and then another time is really cognitively complicated. Uh, and not many animals can keep track of all those moving variables. Uh, but most mammals and probably most birds have some form of theory of mind in the sense that they can probably figure out what you're paying attention to. And they can probably know at some intuitive level that when you're paying attention to something, it means that you can react to it. And when you're not paying attention, it means you're not going to react to it. And most animals, like a prey animal, has to know that because you look at the lion and you're like, well, is he paying attention to me or not? Does he even know I'm here or not? This is really important. Uh, and if you're a predator, you have to know, if I sneak up on him this way, he won't know I'm here. And if he doesn't know I'm here, it's not in his mind. And then he won't react until he sees me. And then it'll be too late. You know, these very basic kinds of uh, theory of mind, knowing that something else has a mind and that items can get into that mind. And that's how the animal behaves. Like that that's very basic theory of mind. Uh, I think that's present in most mammals, most birds. And so my guess is that most mammals and most birds have at least the elements of basic elements of what we mean when we talk about uh, consciousness, the ability to be conscious of things and the ability to attribute conscious states to others. To some degree, these animals have that, some obviously way more complex than others. Hmm. You know, something that hasn't come up yet in the conversation that I wonder if this might pose a problem for the theory, but, or, or maybe it's already an answer that you have is how it accounts for affect. So, uh, I mean, sadness or happiness, they seem to fall like on a, bl like a blanket over everything we're experiencing there. Every, it's not like you have to pay attention to it. It's just, it's just there, but m maybe the way that you would, explain it is 
there is something in the brain that cognition is getting hold of that's being modeled, but it just, everything we're paying attention to is sort of drenched in it. In a sense, I'm not being very specific here, but. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean. So emotion's really interesting. Uh, first of all, not that much is known about it. So it's a bit mysterious to everybody, even the people who study it. Uh, but here's an interesting property of emotions that is perhaps not that well appreciated by most people, unless you really have this kind of experience frequently. People do have the uh, people pay attention or they don't pay attention to their emotions. So you can, emotions are things that you can pay attention to, that you can be aware of or not aware of. This is really weird, but there are many people who are essentially not quote unquote in touch with their emotions. And so they can have an emotional state like anger and not know it until someone points it out. And someone says, man, what are you in a really angry mood? And they're like, what, me? What? Oh, maybe I am. You have to direct their attention to it. Uh, so a lot of emotions are not, uh, are pre-attentive. We're not aware of them, but they're there. Um, and so even in the case of emotions, uh, just like with vision, I mean, it's it's a, it's not exactly like, but there's there's some similarities there. In vision, you look at something, it has a color, but you know nothing about the color unless you're attending to it. Then you can become conscious of it. And with emotions, there's something being processed. There's some kind of emotion model that the brain is building, but you're really not conscious of it until at least some of your attention is on it, on the the fact that you feel that way or that it's uh, coloring your decision-making process, right? So it actually, there is a lot of similarity there uh, between emotions and uh, I think probably everyone uh, has emotions in and out of conscious experience. It's just that we're not used to thinking of it that way. And it's probably people more on the detached from their emotions spectrum that are more familiar with that kind of situation. But they're very similar. I think the biggest difference between emotions and visual processing is that so much more is known about visual processing. It's just a lot easier to talk about scientifically. Uh, and the, on the emotional side, the mechanisms are so mysterious. The brain parts are are barely uh, known, and how they talk to each other is not well known.